Hey everybody, this is Kennedy Hawk from the MCM team, and I'm back for another Tier List Tuesday. This is going to be a big one. We are going to be tier listing all of the Marvel Champions villains slash scenarios. So that means we're going to be going all the way back to the core set and all the way up through Mad Titan Shadow. So if you haven't played all the villains in Mad Titan Shadow, now is your chance to dip out. We're going to be judging these villains on three pieces of criteria. I'm going to be judging them on balance. Is this scenario too easy? Is it too hard? Or is it Goldilocks in it and it's just right? Is this scenario fun? Do I want to keep playing this scenario? Is it something that after I complete it, I'm just going to reset it up and play it again? Or is it something that I'm going to play it once and then say, okay, let's put that back in my box for a couple months? Does it have any pitfalls or negative play experiences? Are there ways that this scenario can snowball into just not a fun game night? So maybe that's more of a balanced question, but for me, that's a fun question. All right, and then I'm going to talk about scaling. Does this scenario scale well with all player counts? Does it provide an equal challenge to a solo player as well as a four-player group or a two- or three-player group? And that's going to be the hardest category for a lot of these villains to face. So, villains not very good at scaling walls. We'll see. All right, we've got our tier list here. We have all our tiers. We have the S tier, Shirley Super Villainous, spelt incorrectly. That was great. We have the A Mighty Good Villain tier. I'm just going to fix that because it's going to bother me. Done. It never happened. We have the A Mighty Good Villain tier, the A tier. We have the B tier, as always. We have the Could Use Some Work to Be More Fun tier. And then we have the I Don't Even Want to Sleeve These D tier villains. Now we're going to try to start at the bottom and work our way up. So to start out our D tier villains, I'm going to go ahead and throw my girl, Nebula, right there. Um, Nebula is just a monster. Whether you're playing in multiplayer or solo, whether you're playing in campaign or standalone, Nebula is just a bad experience. She's a little bit too hard, but she can also be too easy if she just pukes on herself and draws the wrong cards. And to me, that just completely, it kills the funness of the scenario. Because depending on how I shuffle the deck, it's either going to be fun and I'm going to have a chance. Um, or it's going to be fun, not, not fun, and I won't have a chance. Or it'll be not fun and Nebula won't have a chance. But very few are that first category where it's fun and I have a chance. Balance-wise, she's just got too much surge to be enjoyable. I mean, defeating her is surely a feat that is to be celebrated and excited about. But she's definitely on the too hard end of the balance scale. All those cards that, you know, reveal a technique that caused another surge. There's the side scheme that it searches the deck, reveals a technique, and then that technique surges into another card. All of a sudden, you just got three encounter cards. One of them's a side scheme with a hazard symbol that you gotta get rid of, and Nebula's punching you in the face. It's just, it's just not fun. Scaling-wise, I think this one's really poor, too. Um, especially that setup. I really hate the setup on Nebula, where it's just card two per player, and then put those techniques into play. Because I've had a four-player game where we got seven techniques in those first eight cards. And I've had a four-player game where we got one or zero. And that's just not... It's not scaling well with the player count. Surging for every player is really poor, poor scaling. Um, and surging for only the first player is also really poor scaling, right? If you're playing standard... Um, in four player, you only have the chance of one surge divided by four people. That's like a quarter of a surge per person. But in solo, it's, it's one surge per person. So it's really horrible. Um, and I think she's just, she's going to be in the D tier. There's not much I can do about that. Sorry. Sorry, Nebula. That's just where you are. All right. I'm going to go ahead and place Ronin in here too. I don't think he's nearly as bad as Nebula. Really, if I was like ranking these, I'm going to put him here in the front because he's closer to being out of that C tier than ne or D tier than Nebula is. But still, he's just overwhelming numbers. I've seen a lot of people say this well. He's just Rhino on steroids, and it's true. Balance-wise, he's way too hard. The numbers are too high. They don't make it entertaining. Fun-wise, same reason. And scaling, scaling's pretty okay, except for, I mean, the, the way that the Milano has been used in that scenario where you have this hazard symbol, that hazard symbol impacts a solo player a lot more than it impacts a four-player group. So I think that he fails quite a bit on scaling. And those are, those are two of my most disliked villains in the game. And I don't see it changing for a while. Even switching their modular sets up, they're still pretty, pretty nasty. All right, we might end up with some more people in the D tier, but I'm going to leave the D tier for now. Um, and I'm going to put some, some characters that I belong, think belong in the could use some work tier. 
I think Risky Business is a really great idea as far as Green Goblin goes. I love the flipping villain. I love the villain that does different things. It's just a little bit too ga gameable. Um, the balance is just too easy. You can sit in hero form and just let him build up counters while you prepare to save the day, and then you just raffle stomp him really fast. So he, he kind of fails in balance. Fun-wise, I'm putting theme into fun too. I didn't say that earlier, but to me, things that are thematic are fun. I think theme-wise, he's pretty good. And fun-wise, he can be really good as an intro scenario for a newer player. It kind of gives them this false sense of security for when they play a real game. But I think he's good for like helping people learn how the turns go, learn how mechanics go, and things like that. Scaling, I think he scales fine. I think he's a little tricky in solo because he ends up with so few counters on his insanity side that you have to get your damage in really quick. But he doesn't nearly have the scaling problems of Nebula and Ronin. I think if he fails anything, it's probably balance and maybe scaling. I think if they added some cards that trigger based on the number of counters on his environment, that'd be a really good way to balance him because you could no longer just sit back on your stool and build up your board while Norman gains a bunch of shields. Instead, you'd have to try to keep that low, and if you keep it too low, it might flip him or something like that. I think that would be a really cool fix for Risky Business. All right. Next up, let's put Wrecking Crew in the could use some work. I think Wrecking Crew is really close to being a fun scenario. I think if they just had a randomizer on Wrecking Crew, it would be pretty good. Um, being able to control the villain... And which villain activates is what makes this a little too easy. And I really like some of the cards at Wrecking Crew that switch who the active villain is. I think it was a very admirable attempt at a multi-villain scenario. Um, Fun-wise and balance-wise, it's too easy. And it's just a little bit too long for what you get out of it. I think if they gave you a little more urgency and didn't let you control which villain was going. Or if there was like a hard timer on it that said, you can't remove threat from the main scheme when it gets to 6 y'all lose, then you would have a lot more interesting of a race to try to stop the Wrecking Crew from escaping prison, and that could be a little bit more fun. Scaling-wise, I think it's fine. I mean, all four-player games of Marvel Champions scale very poorly in that they take forever, um, but that's not something anyone's going to avoid. I think that that's, that's pretty okay. I'm really happy with the scaling. I think the fun is that it's a little bit too long, and the balance is that it's a little bit too easy, but they could make like a really easy tweak, and this would jump up at least into the B tier, if not higher. All right, Absorbing Man, another C tier villain. Um, so Absorbing Man is from the Rise of Red Skull set. I think he's really entertaining. Um, he's got a cool hook where these different environments come to play and change on how all his cards interact. But the big thing for me is it doesn't actually change how all his cards interact. It changes, like, his final villain form, and there's a lot of cards that say if he has the ice trait or if he has the stone trait. If every card, and this would be a lot of headroom, if every card in Absorbing Man's set triggered based off what environment was in play, that would be way more fun, right? Because every game would be different depending on which environment comes out first instead of it just giving, like, a little boost to some cards. So if every card centered around that environment and didn't just get a bonus if one environment was in play that would make him a lot of fun i really like that he is one of the few villains that has no minions in his set so i find that really interesting i i really appreciate absorbing man for that fact you can control how many minions there are and really test those minion decks when there aren't a lot of minions around or you can over flood it with minions with something like the band of badoon fun wise he's just a little bland um I think his biggest thing is that he's he's too easy, he's a little bland, and he's got some cards that are really poorly scaled, like Avalanche. They're just poorly scaled cards. Anytime you get an encounter card that affects all four players, that's just a little insane. I don't think it should go that way in four player. I think it makes four player a little bit more difficult, which typically is the opposite of what you'd expect. It'd be really, really nice if all player counts had the same difficulty level, but that's a really hard thing to ask. But there's a couple cards in Observing Man's set in particular they deal damage to all four players when drawn, and things like that. And those can be a little, in my opinion, brutal. Alright, we're having a pretty big C tier here. And let's see who else we would put in the C tier. Um, I, I am happy with the order here, as Risky Business being closest. I'm going to put Ebony Maw in the C tier. He is from Mad Titan Shadow. We did our strategy guide on him last week. I think he's got some major balance issues. Um... I guess it's, it's kind of issues in all three categories again. 
I think balance-wise, he's very swingy. He has the potential to burst you down to nothing without anything you can do about it, and he has the potential to just do nothing on you. And it almost feels like Nebula White. Like, he's nowhere near... He's obviously not in the don't-want-to-sleeve-these category. But there's a good chance, or there are chances, that you can draw into or surge into spell environments that can just one-shot your character in a few turns. And putting that clock on yourself and having nothing you can do about it other than hoping to draw into Endurance is a really bad feeling for new players and for experienced groups. Um, and I, I just don't like that strategy. I think all the spells surging makes sense because they have delayed effects, but I wish they would surge if you didn't have another spell in play or something like that, because sometimes you just get surged into too many things and it can just be not fun is the baseline. Scaling-wise, I think he's okay. I don't like his expert setup, where you end up with 8 spells in play and 4-player and none left in the deck, because there's a ton of cards that trigger off looking for spells in the deck. Even his Stage 3 and Main Scheme Stage 2 is going to make every player discard cards from the top of the deck looking for spells. If there's none there, because you're in 4-player and you really rocked and rolled him at the start of the game, I mean, you're just getting 4 acceleration tokens. And having something like that, like a... a a non-fail safe like that come through is really, to me, embarrassing for Ebony Maw. Of the three starter villains in the different campaign boxes, and the core set, he's my least favorite. He's the bottom of those four. So I'm going to I'm gonna put him in the C tier. I think they could rework some of his surge mechanics to make him less swingy and more consistent. And I don't think the villains need to be perfectly consistent, because that would make the game very boring. But they need to not depending on the shuffle, have the chance to kill you turn 2 or do nothing to you turn 2 without the player getting to make any decisions about that. And I think that's just a shame. Alright. C tier, C tier, C tier, huh? I'm gonna go ahead and put Tower Defense in C tier. I really dislike Tower Defense. And I've made that pretty clear in Discord, so I'm sorry if people love Tower Defense. I think this scenario tried to fix a lot of the things that happened in Wrecking Crew. And they fixed him in the wrong direction, in my opinion. Spoiler alert for our recording on Friday. But uh, I love the idea of having two villains out at a time. I don't like any of the implementations of it. In Wrecking Crew, you could kind of decide which villain was the active villain. And here, you don't get to decide that, but it's predetermined. Which is similar to a lot of video games. Uh, and a lot of other... There's some board games where you kind of see the villain queue coming up, so you know what actions the villain's going to take. And that's fine. That's like a cool mechanic. Um... But it leads to a very unengaging gameplay, where you just go into this pattern of, oh, I gotta stun this person because they're going next. Oh, gotta stun this lady because she's going next. And I, I don't enjoy that style of gameplay. I also feel like a lot of the times there's these choices on the cards about what you're going to do, but the choice is very, like, false, right? In solo, you almost never place damage on the tower because it's too dangerous. And in multiplayer, you almost never give the villain a boost because they don't need the boost and there's so much room on the tower. And that just leads to poor scaling. I mean, it means the decision point is different depending on the number of players. And it works really well in like two player and three player. But it means four player, the tower is just kind of unengaging. And in one player, you spend the whole game trying to keep damage off this tower only to draw, you know, a treachery card that just ruins your day. Um, and I don't enjoy that style of play at all. It's just not entertaining or scaled well. It's, it's, Honestly, if I had to come down to it, if I had too many C-tier things, I'd probably put this one in the D-tier. I dislike it that much. So, what else belongs in the C-tier? I'm looking around, and I'm not seeing anything that I totally think belongs here. I would consider Collector 1, and you know what? Do I put him there? I'm gonna... Ugh, the Collectors are tricky for me. They belong in either B or C, and I don't think they belong together. I'm going to go ahead and put Collector 1 in the C tier as well. Collector 1 is the one where he's filling the collection, and you have to like exhaust your character and spend resources and all sorts of things to keep cards out of the collection. It means you can't discard cards from play. It completely shuts off some aspects and style of play, which is a major turnoff for me. The scenario is way too difficult on hard. You're basically on a timer that you have to burst him down, which to me isn't a fun way to play, so I guess that rolls right into the fun category. Is this scenario fun? Honestly, I'm not going to lie. After I stopped playing the campaign for Galaxy's Most Wanted, this guy has not come out of my collection. The collector has been collected because I just don't enjoy this scenario. I mean, you can deck build around it and win, 
but it's not very entertaining to say, okay, well, I built the deck that's the silver bullet to this scenario, and I won. Hooray! Um, it doesn't it doesn't scratch my itch. So, Collector 1, I think he's just too prohibiting to some characters to be balanced well. He doesn't even scale well, just due to the way the collection grows and how many encounter cards can add things to the collection, that I think it's just... He could use some work. He could use some work. And we're going to rearrange some things here so you all know what order I would place them in. Yeah, that's probably where I would put it. Absorbing Man below Ebony Maw. Tower Defense at the very bottom. Borderline D. Alright, we're getting into a more positive headspace here. Let's get into the B-tier scenarios. I feel like Collector 2 is a very good B-tier scenario. I don't think it's too easy. It can definitely be gamed, sort of like Wrecking Crew can. But you still have to have some semblance of sanity. And the encounter deck still... It tries to counteract the thing that's going to help you win thwarting. There's lots of confusion, there's lots of high scheme values, there's lots of damage causing you to flip. And I think that it, it makes for a very interesting scenario. Fun-wise, thematically, it's great. It feels exactly like how a chase scene should feel. I wish there was one of these in Rise of the Red Skull. I would love that box if this existed. Um, I do think that it lends itself to a certain type of play style. So you kind of have to have this suspension of disbelief or, oh my gosh... Suspension of, um, it. I have not had enough coffee yet today. You have to like, you know, not game the system. If you run four justice characters and just burn the schemes down, yeah, you're gonna win. Whoop de doo. I don't know. He's he's kind of middle of the ground. I don't think he's someone that I'm gonna set up all the time. But he's definitely not collecting dust in my game box. I definitely put him in my randomizer when I randomize things, and that's where he belongs. I'm going to put Kang in the B tier as well. I know a lot of people really love Kang. They love the thematics of Kang and all sorts of things. Balance-wise, I think Kang is pretty good. I think uh, the, way, the way they did the split-off scenarios works really well until someone else joins your Kang 2 environment or play area. All of a sudden, when Kang is scheming against two different players, or if like one player enters an Alter Ego mode, it just almost automatically pops his scheme, which is a bit unfortunate. I wish the... The scaling had scaled off how many characters were in your area or something, so people could join without you just being doomed because someone joined your area. But ultimately, I think he's a pretty fun scenario. He is a little bit long for me. I think the player scaling is totally fine. The balance is pretty much totally fine. The fun is just, if I want to play a long game of four-player Marvel Champions, let's go play a three-hour game of Kang. I don't know if I'm going to do that a ton, because it's a three-hour game of Kang, but uh, it's, it's a game still. All right, who else belongs in the B tier? I'm going to put Loki there. If you haven't gotten to the end of Mad Titan Shadow yet, surprise, Loki appears. Loki is really interesting to me. I like how he swaps villains. I like the thematics of him. Balance-wise, it can be really dangerous to go into Alter Ego against him. He gets really high and schemey, and he forces you into Alter Ego a lot. But he's like the finale villain. He should be hard. He shouldn't be impossible. He shouldn't be Ronan Nebula hard, but he should be hard. My main complaint against Loki is they, they pushed so hard into the Infinity Gauntlet mod that he sort of just feels like a mini Thanos. And I mean, some may argue that Loki should feel like a mini Thanos, since Thanos is like the big bad of the Marvel Universe. But I, I felt like they felt a little too similar. I wish one of them had used the gauntlet in a, in a different way than it's intended to be used, and that could have been a little interesting. So for now, he sits in B tier for me. He's definitely someone that I'll pull out a lot, especially like now because the box basically just came out. Um, but I expect him to be one that's kind of like Collector 2 and Kang, where I bring him out every once in a while on a game night, but he's not someone that I'm like packing up to bring to every game night ever. Speaking of, let's get Taskmaster in here, and let's start arranging these in the right order. Taskmaster's the same way. Um... I really like his thematics. I really like his balance. I feel like the allies make him a little bit too easy, and maybe he should have some ally hate in his deck to counteract those captured allies. Fun-wise, I think he's super fun. You're always excited to see that captured ally side scheme and see which one you get. And scaling-wise, I think he works okay. Um, I think he does a really good job of pushing into this mechanic of like forcing you to flip, but also making it so you don't want to flip. And it's this... Uh, good decision point for the player characters, which is what I think every scenario should have. So I'm really happy with the 
flipping decision points that Taskmaster pushes. I think the thematics of like discarding and looking for attack and thwart events, those cards are just great. Um, and for that, he deserves a B tier spot. Probably lower on the B tier, but still a B tier spot. All right. This might make people mad, but I'm going to put Ultron at the top of the B tier here. I think Ultron is balanced. I think he's super fun in Standard. I think he's a little bit more challenging in Expert, just because that last stage makes him unable to take damage, and you got to do some sequencing there. I think that he's a fun scenario as well. I think he has an interesting mechanic uh, and forces you into a different style of play where you're bringing lots of little damage and then big damage to hit Ultron. My main problem with him is scaling. There's a lot of cards in Ultron that hit all four players. Everyone puts a drone into play. Everyone does this. Everyone does that. Those are really bad scaled, poorly scaled cards for multiplayer, and it makes four player a drag. And for that, Ultron ends up in the B tier. I wish he was scaled a little better for four player. I wish like you couldn't damage Ultron if there was a drone engaged with you, right? So you had to make the decision of do I help Captain America out over here or do I go for face? Um, and not having that decision is a little painful with Ultron. I feel like a little too much hitting all the players, um, which just drags a four-player game out, which is the opposite of what a four-player game needs. All right. Who's rounding out the B tier here? Um, I think I'm going to put Rhino in here, somewhere near the bottom. Rhino belongs in the B tier because there's nothing, nothing special about him. I mean, balance-wise, I think he's okay. Scenario's not too easy. It's not too hard. It's a great intro scenario. Fun-wise, there's nothing better than, like, Raffle stomping on Rhino and making him charge into tough counters or brick walls. Um, scaling, he, he's kind of like Ultron. He, scale, he scales really poorly to solo. The fact that you can lose in solo just by sitting in Alter Ego form for one turn, even if you get the threat to zero, is dumb. It's just dumb. Like, you, do, you don't feel good when that happens, because there's nothing you could have done to prevent it. There's nothing you did wrong other than getting everything perfectly aligned and then having the encounter deck screw you. So I am a bit disappointed in Rhino's solo scaling. I wish they had figured out some way around that. It's really hard this early in the game to know what the popular player count's going to be, so I kind of give them a pass on it. And I've played a lot of multiplayer Rhino that's been really fun. But solo Rhino is just a little bit disappointing. And I think I think I'm done with the B tier. We've got lots of villains left, and I don't know who's going to be surely the superest super villain of them all. But we'll find out shortly. All right, let's start out with Claw. Claw is definitely a mighty good villain. Claw with his double boost cards gives us something that no one else has. Other people have it every once in a while where they get a second boost card, but Claw gets it for every attack activation. He has really interesting side schemes and forces you into side schemes and minions, which is something a lot of the other villains don't. Some force you into one side scheme or into a couple of minions, but none of them force you into both the way Claw does. Um, I really like his ability to mix with new modular sets. Every time a new mod comes out that has any boost abilities, the little star symbols, I almost instantly try it with Claw because it's so exciting. Like when Hood comes out, I'm just going to go wild with Claw for like three weeks and play nothing else because that's honestly what I want to do. I would almost put him in the surely super villainous category if I wasn't saving that for one specific character. Claw is almost surely super villainous. I think he's really fun. He forces you to exhaust a lot. He offers a lot of variance because sometimes his boost cards get hit for zero and sometimes they can hit for six, which can be very frustrating for players. But knowing that going in is half the battle. I think that Claw belongs in the A Mighty Good Villain tier. And if you want to fight me about it, let me know in the comments below. All right, here's the villain everybody hates, Zola. I love Zola. I love that Retaliate is permanently on a villain, and you have to figure a way around it. He hurts allies, but not in a way that makes allies useless, like Collector uh, 1. Um, I think he's a completely different version of Swarm, similar to Ultron, that scales very well in player count. Um, you're basically, with his four activations, getting one minion a turn from his little experiment counters. But at the same time, you've got four people to deal with that minion, so it doesn't feel too bad. They could have done something really horrible and like said, oh, well, when you get to one per player test counters, go search for a minion. That would have been horrible in Solo. So I feel like they really paid attention to the player counts with Zola and tuned him to feel well. I think in Solo it can be a little bit painful when that minion comes out because it could be a really big minion. 
but at the same time, you've had more time to prepare for it. Um, he is still weak to stun and confuse and stuff like that, and that gives the solo player a lot more power than a multiplayer team has. I think Zola's great. Um, every time a minion heavy mod comes out, he's someone that I try out immediately, just like Claw with those boost abilities, and he is definitely a mighty good villain. Alright, we're going to put Hela in the A Mighty Good Villains category. If you haven't played Galaxy's Mo or not Galaxy's Most Wanted, you've probably played that and put it away. If you haven't played Mad Titan Shadow yet, you will play against Hela eventually, and she has a completely different way of playing Marvel Champions. There's no longer a threading out loss on the main scheme. Or, well, I guess there kind of is. There's no longer a defeating the villain due to damage sort of scenario. You've got to progress through this story by eliminating side schemes and minions and side schemes and really get Hela to the point where you can defeat her. I really like her scenario. Um, I feel like it's very good at storytelling, which I'm a big fan of. I feel like it has sort of the split focus that Nebula does, where you're worrying about her. I wouldn't even talk about her evasion counters. That's really why she's in like the F tier. But um, she has this balance of techniques and evasion counters, and you have to counterbalance those two different gimmicks that she has. Hela has a very similar thing with her wounded and non-wounded side, and then with her progression through her story and all her attachments, um, but they actually balance well together, right? There's multiple different strategies to victory. One of them isn't necessarily better than the other, so players can, like, pick the path they want, and then depending on the encounter deck, they find out if they picked the, the harder path or the easier path, and I love that about Hela. I will be playing Hela hell a lot from the Mad Titan Shadow Box, and she is a mighty good villain. Alright, we're getting down to it. I'm going to put Thanos in the a mighty good villain category. Thanos, I think, is super balanced. His high threat threshold really makes him playable in solo, but also not impossible to lose in multiplayer. It's a little bit hard to get snapped in 4-player with 40 threat per player or whatever it ends up being, 44, maybe even 48, I can't remember. Um, but with the way his gauntlet works, it accelerates a lot more, so I think it kind of counterbalances that and scales pretty well. Like, you get this huge threat threshold, but, you know, you're cycling through that Infinity Gauntlet deck and giving him boost cards a lot more frequently. Fun-wise, I think no villain in the game gets more thematic than Thanos with his snap, and I'm really happy with how they incorporated it and how they implemented it and how it feels when it goes off. It's just this feeling of ultimate dread. Not knowing, and the way we play it is you can't look to the cards you set aside. So until you go back through your deck, you have no idea what's there. And what's disappeared and what's not. And it's it's so fun to play Thanos. I I might bump him up to S here in a minute, um, if I'm feeling it. We'll see. Alright, let's continue. I really like Red Skull. Red Skull, with the way he brings out side schemes every turn, is really interesting. He interacts with different modular sets different ways every time. I feel like he's very balanced and fair, um, especially scalable from solo to multiplayer. Yeah, side schemes are harder in multiplayer, but you're only getting one a turn. You don't have the chance to draw multiple of them from the encounter deck, and you get four players to deal with them, so I feel like it's it's somewhat okay since only one is coming out per turn. Um some of the side schemes are very poorly scaled for solo. Maybe that's something I should say. Fun-wise, I think he's really fun. He feels thematic. He feels on point. I like that they mix in some side schemes that solving them helps you, right? Otherwise, why should the heroes go solve a side scheme other than reducing Red Skull's stats? They should be focusing on the main villain. But now we know they get a bonus for doing that. They get an ally. They get whatever. Um, I think that's very entertaining. I love Red Skull. He will be played for a long, long time. You can see I am very Red Skull biased in my box categories here. I have two villains from Rise of Red Skull and two villains from Mad Titan Shadow. And they're the last two villains of those boxes all in the A Mighty Good Villains tier. And we're going to finish it off with Crossbones, another villain from the Rise of Red Skull. A lot of people don't like Crossbones, but I really like Crossbones. He feels like a different version of the chase scenario that is Collector 2. In this version... You're chasing after him and trying to stop him as he progresses through his scheme instead of chasing by th removing threat from the scheme. Um, those low threat thresholds offer a very interesting checkpoint for players of can I defeat this villain while keeping the threat from getting out of control and him snowballing to a victory. I think his the fact that he gets three modular sets means he's like super customizable. He feels different every time you play him. I like the way the weapons function. Everything about crossbones is something that I really like. Probably one of my top villains in the game. Alright, let's get these ordered here a little bit. 
This is how I feel they would go. If I was going to demote somebody right now, it would be Crossbones. If I was going to promote somebody, it would be Thanos. All right. Let's place Drang right where he belongs. Right above Zola. I think Drang is another version, especially in expert mode, of a minion-heavy scenario. He thrives off having those minions in play. I really like the thematics and fun feeling you get from the Milano in Drang. You don't get that in any of the other scenarios with the Milano, really. He always has this, like... The Milano always has this thing it has to be doing. But with Drang, you actually get the option to use it. And I think that that is really fun. I think he's pretty well balanced for multiplayer. I think that, uh... Yeah, I, th I think he's pretty well balanced for multiplayer. I think he scales pretty well. Um, the two threat per player can get a little brutal in four player. Um, but I think that ultimately it's it's brutal in solo too, so it, it hurts either way in a Galaxy's Most Wanted kind of way. Um, he's a different kind of minion villain where he is not just pooping minions out from his encounter cards. Instead, it's um, when his villain flips to that stage that pumps out minions. Um, and I think that's really entertaining. And then we've got Mutagen Formula. Um, jokes, putting it in A tier. I think Mutagen Formula is really fun. Um, it's one of the classics from the first villain pack. I think it blows a lot of scenarios out of the way. It's really good in standard, can teach people the mechanics of the game. In expert, it pumps up that level by having you start with encounter cards. And it gets even crazier when you get to stage three. Um, it, it very much feels like an upgraded Ultron, where you're fighting against Ultron, but his guys aren't little piddly dink guys they're like a little bit harder but they're also a little less frequent than his are but with that initial surge of encounter cards he still feels really difficult um, but not impossibly or unsurmountably difficult so the ideal difficulty curve for me is to be like in the 70 percent range of difficulty um, and by that i mean like if i'm rating their difficulty from zero to 100 percent, i want someone to be in the 70 to 80 percent range which is where i feel like all these a tier villains are I don't want it to be in the 100% range or 200% range like Ronin or Nebula, and I don't want it to be in the 0 to 10% like Risky Business or like the Wrecking Crew. So you kind of got to be in that optimal spot. The one thing that does it for me is I think Thanos is a little more enjoyable in 4-player. I think it feels epic. I think it feels ultimate. I think you really feel the dread of letting the main scheme flip. And you feel that dread in Mutagen Formula too, but sometimes once you flip, you can actually control the board better in multiplayer. Um, whereas with Thanos, you know you're going to have some kind of person that's lost a part of their combo, and you have to figure out how the team's going to scrape together and get by. I really love Thanos. He is probably what keeps Mad Titan Shadow in the running for best box for me. You can see right here, I've got three villains from... Rise of Red Skull in the ANS tier, two from Mad Titan Shadow, and one from Galaxy's Most Wanted. I think Loki's close to pushing his way up into the A tier, so I think those two boxes are pretty equivalent, but you get you get like the ultimate villain in Mad Titan Shadow, so I definitely recommend you try it out. This is where I tier list my villains. Remember, I'm judging them based off balance, fun slash theme, and scalability with all multi with all different player counts. You might have a different opinion about where these villains fall, uh, which ones are which ones are unfun, which ones are more fun. Let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear your reasoning as to why Wrecking Crew belongs in the S tier. I'm sure someone will say it, and we will read it here. For now, have a great Tuesday, and I will see everybody tomorrow for a Workout Wednesday.